The EU is in favour of a youth migration deal uh, with the UK because it's taking a long-term view that it believes that Britain will at some point return to the EU, that the opinion of young people is very important, and therefore coming to some arrangement which restores the capacity for British young people to come to the continent to live and study and work, etc., um, is a very valuable political objective. But that is a, a different matter from the issues associated with illegal migration. Hello, I'm Brendan Donnelly. I'm the director of the Federal Trust. And today I shall be talking to the chair of the Federal Trust, John Stevens, uh, about the first couple of months uh, of the new Labour government led by Keir Starmer, and in particular about its European policy. Uh, John, the present, the new Labour government, uh, likes to talk uh, often about a, a reset of relations between the UK and the EU. Uh, has such a reset occurred? Is it occurring? Can it occur in the future? Will there be limits imposed upon it uh, by the, the much touted red lines of the present Labour government? Well, I think the attempt to have a reset, which has been underway with various visits by uh, Sir Keir Starmer to uh, the continent, to Germany and to France, um, and the meeting which was organised at Blenheim Palace, um, has really led nowhere, has revealed what has been obvious to everyone who is familiar with this topic, uh, that uh, the limits that he has imposed upon uh, government policy uh, towards the European Union really makes any reset meaningless, apart from being simply rather more friendly than the uh, Conservatives were, which um, is not a very high bar. There has been some success, it appears, in his courting of the French and German leaders in that they've sent a, a letter, supposedly to the Commission, um, urging an arrangement between the UK and the EU um, in, in controlling, uh, cooperating on the control of uh, of migration. Is, is that a, a success, a part of a reset? Well, that has been driven by the internal politics of the EU and the fact that for a range of reasons, particularly in Germany, and in France, uh, the saliency of the immigration issue has grown very significantly. And it remains to be seen how the UK will uh, react to that from its point of view. At the moment, uh, the government has indicated that it has no real interest in a youth mobility scheme of any kind. But it might be that they were interested in something that was uh, a, a, an arrangement. Um, to, to limit or, or to deter even um, uh, illegal migration, not necessarily by the young people of youth mobility, involved in youth mobility, uh, but more generally, there, there seems to be uh, a response coming from France and Germany, which I'm sure, as you say, is generated by, by internal political considerations, um, that, that there might be scope for more cooperation between the EU um, and the United Kingdom on dealing with irregular migration rather than youth mobility. Well, you're right that it's very important to distinguish the issue of asylum seeking and um, illegal immigration with the issue of uh, satisfying the labour requirements um, of the European economy, including the British economy. Um, in the former case, uh, what the EU is seeking is some burden sharing of the current inflows into Europe of illegal migration. And that will be a very hot topic for the Labour government to deal with. Do you think that uh, an agreement on youth mobility is a, a precondition, as some people have said, uh, for uh, any significant reset or amelioration of uh, EU-UK relations? Why well, the, does the EU attach so much importance to this? Well, the, the EU is in favour of uh, a youth migration deal uh, with the UK because it's taking a long-term view that it believes that Britain will at some point return to the EU, that the opinion of young people is very important and therefore coming to some arrangement which 
restores the capacity for British young people to come to the continent to live and study and work, etc., um, is a very valuable political objective. But that is a, a different matter from the issues associated with illegal migration. Yeah. And uh, it is true, I think, that some people in the EU believe that this could be a lever um, in securing a deal on illegal migration with the UK. Um, because clearly, offering young people in Britain the opportunity to come to the continent, restoring the, the rights that they had as EU citizens, um, is a very attractive proposition. Um, they believe, and they're right. Um, the only side problem is that the UK government doesn't really believe that and is wrong. Yes, and and uh, in addition to having a uh, a general argument about the supposed uh, uh, preferability of uh, indigenous workers rather than um, importing foreign workers, um, uh, the government has shown itself extremely cautious in the past two months uh, on anything that could uh, offend um, the right wing press. Brexit, pro-Brexit press, um, the, the Leave constituency. Why do you think they've been so cautious? Well, because I think they realise that immigration is a huge issue. And it is a huge issue, particularly with a key portion of uh, the electorate that it lost in 2019 to the Conservatives, um, and which it has only to a degree regained in the last general election. I think some people were very puzzled by the last minute declaration by Sir Keir Starmer, literally the day before the election, uh, that he couldn't imagine returning to the EU in his lifetime. What precipitated this was, I think, a, a moment of panic when his polling experts revealed that uh, the lead that uh, had seemed to be established by the Labour Party over the Conservatives in the run-up to that election of nearly 20 points was in fact much smaller. And of course, the general election result revealed that that lead was only 10%. Um, and it is the fragility of the Labour Party's current victory. I and mean, it has enormous majority, but it is an, a majority based on a, a very low overall vote share and one where the Reform Party, which is taking the lead as being the anti-immigration party, having previously been essentially the Brexit party, well, still is essentially the Brexit party, um, is in second place in some 90 seats um, that the Labour Party held. Ian yes, Starmer was in favour of a, a second referendum for a long time, um, and yet now he seems to speak in almost messianic terms of the inviolability of the Brexit result of not wanting to be seen to, be, to betray Brexit. Um, surely this goes beyond uh, pure electoral calculation. It seems to me he's convinced himself that there's some, some moral question here, uh, which he wants to be on the right side of. Well, the trick in politics, as indeed in market trading, um, is always to believe that whatever you are doing at any particular time is somehow absolutely the right thing um, in overall terms. Uh, it's a, a curious trait of uh, the political process. Uh, in order to, su to succeed in any endeavour, you have to convince yourself completely that it is the right thing. A skepticism very and caution and a realism frequently are the victims of political processes. So I, I don't think one should assume that, that there is anything necessarily fundamental about what is going on. What Sakir is worried about is the fact that uh, the traditional Labour vote has got a very significant anti-European component to it at the moment. And he believes that that has to be appeased. And that, in my view, is his fundamental error, because you cannot fund appease such a position. Um, it is a mistaken position. It is one which has brought on Brexit and which has caused uh, untold damage to the UK, a damage which will only grow with time. And the only way in which it can be addressed is by a head-on attack, by saying that Brexit was a monumental error and is based on fundamental misappreciation of 
the national interest. You but think that um, he'll come? Do you think that Starbuck will come under pressure, either from economic events or members of his own party, to to change this position to adopt one that is more in 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 lines with the the analysis you've just sketched? I'm sure he will, but he is in a race against the false credibility of the Brexit case, which has a, a, a chameleon character to it. Farage um, is now leading on the issue of immigration. Previously, he was issue, he was leading on the on the issue of Brexit. Brexit has in, in fact made the immigration issue far more complicated to resolve. Uh, and has added to it in, in a whole range of ways. Um, and yet he escapes that by um, no one actually taking on the core of his position, which has been Brexit and the arguments that he deployed for Brexit. And equally, if Zakir wishes to liberate himself from the shadow of reform, he has to attack reform head on. But reform rise has um, a whole range of, of powerful supporters. It has the interests of that element, the, the finance, financial element of the Brexit cause, that the, the people who um, gave significant sums to it, um, who have, want this Singapore on Thames model, and they are still trying to revive this, and they see reform as their vehicle. Um, and their great hopes are, of course, what happens in the United States, what happens in the, in the forthcoming presidential election. They want a Trump victory. And if there is a Trump victory, Farage becomes much more dangerous. Reform becomes much more dangerous. And, and that, I think, is what um, Sakir is really worried about. But need he be so worried? Uh, Trump and things he stands for are, are profoundly unpopular in the United Kingdom. I'd have thought that uh, it would be rather uh, a, an attractive proposition for Keir Starmer to distance himself very vigorously from Trump and what he's doing. Well, that is true uh, to a degree, but I think that underestimates uh, the capacity for uh, what Trump represents, which is essentially... Uh, a defense of the particular interests of uh, the winners from the globalization of the last 30 years or so um, to protect themselves against the, the losers from that by telling the losers that they have other enemies. They have immigration, essentially, as an enemy, uh, the other, essentially, as an enemy. And this is a very powerful combination, as we've seen in the support of some leading figures in Silicon Valley and and, and in uh, among the, the super rich in America. And, and it has parallels here and should not be underestimated as a threat because it is also a, a threat to the democratic process overall and democratic values overall. The idea that um, we are inviolable to those and that British culture is fundamentally um, immune to such threats is, I fear, an illusion, just as it is proving such in America. A couple of final questions. Uh, you talked about uh, the hope, um, belief, in some sources, in some uh, elements of, of, of the Brussels um, institutions, that the United Kingdom will eventually rejoin the European Union. Um, my impression is that, that, that at the moment, um, um, the United Kingdom, relationships with the United Kingdom, is, is not a high priority in, in Brussels. Um, what do you take to be the general reaction of people in Brussels specifically to uh, the attempts of Keir Starmer to reset relations with the European Union? Well, I don't think Brussels is very concerned with the UK at the moment. Uh, and the principal reason for that is that the one thing that really worries the EU is the situation in Northern Ireland and relationships uh, over Ireland and the problems that Brexit has created for Northern Ireland and for the Irish Republic. And there, <coughs> the uh, political position has improved greatly from the point of view of stability because there was a fear um, a year or so ago that Sinn Féin would perform very well in the forthcoming um, Irish elections. Um, and that this would uh, increase pressure for border poles and the tension in Northern Ireland and, and make 
uh, a confrontation, potential confrontation between uh, the UK government and the EU more likely. It now seems that uh, there will probably be an election in November in the Irish Republic and that the current coalition will almost certainly survive and Sinn Féin will not be the challenge that some people feared it might be um, not so long ago. Uh, and I think that's the principal reason why um, the whole situation is much more relaxed. But behind this is the shadow of the US election. Um, and we have to see what the result of that is um, before one can really make a judgment on any of these questions. Yeah. Some people have, have, have um, characterised uh, Starmer's attitude towards this reset with the European Union um, as being uh, long on hope and short on planning. Uh, is that a, a gen general criticism that people are beginning to make, should begin to make, um, of the Labour Party, uh, of, of the government headed by Keir Starmer? Um, a lot of people think that its uh, economic prospects are, are, are much better on the rhetorical side than on the practical and administrative side. And is, is the emptiness, if you will, of the European prospect um, emblematic of, of a, a, a deeper problem in the Labour Party go Party's government? Well, I think, the, the, as I indicated earlier, I think the real error that... Uh, Sakir Starmer is making and the Labour Party is making is that it is uh, going down the same path that the Conservatives did towards the overall issue of our relationship with Europe um, in seeking to appease those who oppose it, who oppose um, Europe and who supported Brexit. And that cannot be done. Um, if Brexit is, as, as I believe, a disaster for Britain, as Sir Keir Starmer believes, as most people in the Labour Party believe is a disaster for Britain, then you have to make the case for that. You have to attack head on those who favoured Brexit and all the arguments that that uh, issue and that promotion of Brexit um, brought with it. And that, that duty cannot be evaded. This fight has to be had because otherwise uh, they will be paralyzed in addressing uh, the the overall issues which they face in government and particularly the, the economic ones. It seems to me there's an odd parallel between Theresa May and Keir Starmer that um, both of them knew that Brexit was balmy, but both of them thought that it was more than their job was worth to say so publicly. Now, May was right about that, but Starmer isn't. It's a curious contrast between the two of them. Thank you very much indeed, John. We'll be talking further about these issues in due course. Goodbye. Goodbye, everyone.